Um, <clears throat> so I believe that this is something that we we'll we'll see more of it in the in the future. So I'm hoping that this information I'll present will be of some interest and value. Um, here's a picture of a, a municipal rose garden. This is in, in Winter Park in Florida in about 2003, 2004. Um, and you can see that the, the, the bushes suddenly became defoliated for unknown reasons. And it, on closer inspection, it turned out that there was a new invasive thrips in this that was causing the problem and developed very, very high numbers to the point where the plants became completely defoliated. And because it was a new species, it took a while to figure out what it was. but um, we'd known that it had probably come in through the Caribbean and it seemed to spread very quickly and it got a lot of people's attention. So here's just a little bit of background to this species so you're familiar with it. Um, for the first thing to note is that even as far as thrips go, it's small. It's about half the length or less of a typical flower thrips, which you may also find on roses. Um, it's the, the, one of the best ways to just diagnose it in the field is if you use a hand lens and you look down the back, you can often see kind of a dark line where the wings converge. That's one diagnostic feature. Um, there's also little red spots between its eyes. And the other thing you'll notice about this species is that it tends to occur on the foliage. It's primarily a foliage feeder. Okay, so many of the flower fruits we're familiar with they get inside the buds and the blooms and they cause kind of problems there. Um, but with the chili thrips, you're going to be finding a lot of the damage is going to be on the young leaves. Um, and another thing to note about this thrips is that it tends to have a set stage in the soil. So if you treat a rose bush and kill the thrips on there, um, they will be, be um, emerging from the soil and reinvesting your plants. So they're not necessarily easy to control. Here's just a few pictures of the different life stages, um, in case you're curious. Um, so the larvae, the thrips larvae are typically yellow. Um, they are also very cryptic. Uh, the pupae and the pre-pupal stages are shown in the, in the pictures there as well. And here's just a, a short video of the, uh, here you have an adult in the middle of the screen, um, and there's another adult running up lower on the screen. And you can also see a larvae feeding here as well. That would be the, the pale yellow one. Um, and so what, the way thrips feed is they're a little bit different than things like aphids. They, they pierce and, and destroy plant cells and they cause, and if they attack the growing, the growing portions of the plant, the plant becomes deformed as it grows. And so you get typically symptoms like um, crinkling and deformation and curling, all these sort of symptoms which oftener can be associated with thrips. So what I'll do, I'll show some symptoms uh, that have been caused by chili thrips on, on, first of all on roses because the, this is a primarily about roses. Um, but they do attack a number of other plants. So I'll show some damage symptoms from other plants as well which you, which you might want to be familiar with. So as I just mentioned, they, they like the foliar terminals and the young leaves. And so you can see a couple of pictures here. Um, this is very fresh damage. You can see the discolor portions where the uh, thrips have been feeding. Um, and here's another picture. So this would be also showing the damage that you can get to the developing buds and how the flowers will not open. Um, and you can see this is um, comparing a, a, a one plant from one of our insecticide trials. So you can see the difference between a control and a treated plant here. So the, the symptoms become progressively worse um, up to the point where the plant can no longer, under heavy infestation, the rose plant basically can't put out any new growth because as soon as it, it puts out new growth, that growth is infested um, and the plant is basically unable to put out new growth. So if, if, if left alone, an infestation will basically stop a plant from growing. Here's some more symptoms. You can often see that the discoloration on the underside of the leaf most of the feeding occurs on the underside of the leaf. Um, and you will sort of get this brown, bronzing and browning and stunting kind of look on, on, on a rose bush that's infested. It, once you get your eye in, the symptoms become quite clear, although they can superficially resemble herbicide drift, um, sometimes mite damage. So really the best thing to do is to try to 
uh, sample the plant and pull off the threats and get a positive identification. Now, I'll talk a little bit about that. Another plant that we see chili trips on quite commonly in, in, uh, in Florida and also I believe in parts of Texas is Indian hawthorn. Um, often you'll get the damage early in the season, you know, March, April, when the hawthorn starts putting out new growth, uh, the, the, the chili trips will attack it and you get the, this sort of, the leaves will become, first of all, they'll kind of go reddish bronze and later on they'll become black. Um, the leaves will typically stay on the plant, but you can actually get plants, I've seen plants that have 50% of the leaves almost black um, from chili thrips damage that occurred earlier. And some people mistake this as a leaf rust um, and spray fungicides or think there's a disease issue. Um, also, you don't want to confuse chili thrips damage with the entomosporum leaf spot, which of course is very common. Um, and it doesn't, the plant seems to survive, it doesn't kill the plant, but, but again, you do get, quite, I've seen quite large plantings of Indian hawthorn that's, that become very discolored through chili thrips feeding. Okay, and there you can just see the difference between the leaves with the fresh damage and how that damage turns out on the older leaves there. This is on uh, Schaeflera. Again, you can see this kind of terminal feeding, you can see how you get the deformation and the crinkling on the, on the terminals. And under severe cases, it will stop the plant from growing. This is uh, on Plumbago. Uh, this is a, uh, I got this picture from Stephen Brown, from Lee County Extension in Florida. And you can see in the foreground where you have this, this uh, planting of Plumbago that should be quite bushy and, and lots of showy blue flowers. And it's become quite deformed and dwarfed. And this was a result of chili fruits feeding. And now we don't see this in all areas. In some areas, chili fruits don't seem to get on the Plumbago. So it's not always clear why this happens, but in, in parts of Florida, Plumbago has been hit very hard. And of course, we have a lot of Plumbago in Texas, so this is something to look out for. Uh, this is a this is a, a photo by Dan Gilrain. Uh, this is damage to hydrangea up in New York, um, where it, it's become a quite a big problem on hydrangea in New York. But we haven't seen chili trips on hydrangeas in other states, so. We think there might be a, a different strain. The strain from New York might actually originate from a different source population. But that's still something to look out for. And then chili trips is also a, a problem on many vegetables. So this is um, on pepper. Um, and this is from one of our trials that I, that I did. And you can see that it will also attack the fruits. Um, the plant becomes deformed and, and you get very little fruit damage. In fact, some, some growers in Florida, pepper growers, have found chili thrips becoming a pest. It's also become a pest in strawberries in, in western part of the state where strawberries are a big crop. Um, and in fact, chili thrips was first found on pepper in Texas. And so this is also something to look out for. Okay, so I just want to spend a couple of minutes talking about how this insect entered the United States, which is quite, is quite interesting. So it's been in Hawaii since the mid 1980s, where, where it's quite well established. Um, it was first discovered in, on the mainland in about 2003 to 2005, depending on which reports you, you read, um, in Florida, which spread very rapidly in that state. Um, since 2005, it's been in Texas, and it's spreading more slowly, but it is spreading. Um, in 2007, it was discovered in Georgia in 2008 in Louisiana, where it's a, a big problem on roses in, Louis, in Louisiana currently. Um, and uh, Yan Shen from Louis, Louis, Louisiana State University has been doing some nice research uh, there on, on chili thrips. Um, in 2014, it was a population was discovered in New York, and it seems to be able to survive outside um, at least it needs to be, a, be able to survive in greenhouses and then reinfest outdoor areas. So that's, that's kind of interesting because we wouldn't expect it to survive that far north. And then, interesting, in 2015 it was discovered in California. And uh, that's a big issue because California has got a huge agriculture industry and many susceptible crops. And so it's causing a lot of concern out there right now. Um, and so I think that, you know, this is something that we're going to hear more about. Uh, this is just a... A, a USDA APHIS map that predicts, based on climate, how far this chili thrips can spread. And it's been quite interesting, This, this, how it's actually, um, at least in 
in the United States, it seems to be tracking this map. Um, we might expect it to move further up the Pacific, into the Pacific Northwest in the coming years. Okay, so Texas. I, I noticed from the registration uh, list that Meng, Meng Meng sent, most of you are from Texas, so, and I want to um, go through where we know it exists. Now, this could be an incomplete map, and I'd be very happy to hear from people that think they have chili threats and receive samples so we can update this map, but um, a lot of this information came from Gay Hammond, who, uh, she's the past president of the Houston Rose Society, and she's very knowledgeable on uh, chili threats. And I'll give her email later in the, at the end of the talk. Um, but it was so chili threats was first discovered down in Hildago County in 2005 on peppers in Walmart, and then a big investigation um, was noted in the Harris County area around Houston. Um, and over the coming years, um, it kind of spread to the surrounding counties. So it's in Galveston County, Fort Bend County, uh, Montgomery County. We know this. There's relatively well-established populations there. Um, and Gay tells me that it's commonly found inside the I-610 loop and down by the Texas Medical Center. So also I found it in Brazos County. Um, we've had interceptions in Iraq County up near Fort Worth. Um, and Laura Miller um, at, at Texas AgriLife Extension Nation told me she found it in production up there. I don't know whether it's established. Um, it's also been found in we have unconfirmed reports of it in uh, McClellan and Travis County. That's pictures of symptoms and suspected um, populations. So it's beginning to spread. It's probably a lot more widely distributed than this map indicates. Uh, hopefully we can update this map this year based on uh, new samples being submitted. Uh, in terms of how they're getting around, it's definitely, um, I've often seen them in, in garden centers on plants, so they are being shipped around. It seems to be how, how they're getting around. You need to be aware of that. So if you're buying plants, um, be, be very aware of that. Um, on roses, at least, and possibly other plants as well. So in terms of scouting, you know, the, an easy way to scout for chili trips is just by, not, by using a simple plant tapping method just knock the thrips onto a, a sheet of white paper or, or an artist palette and then you can um, you can look for them on take take samples um, typically if you want to send samples put them in rubbing alcohol and then they can be um, diagnosed and um, there is a program in Florida that's biotyping them because we know that there's two trips is actually a species complex there's actually a number of different cryptic species, and we're trying to get a handle on which ones we have in uh, in the United States. So, okay, here's some data from a student of mine um, in the past uh, who actually quantified what part of the plant the thrips were found on, and in order to determine which leaf was the best to sample, and we actually determined that it was the third leaf that had the greatest population. There's a slight distribution of the adults in the mature stages. But this really refers to rapidly growing plants. Once a plant's not growing so quickly, those populations will concentrate more on the um, outer parts of the plants. OK, so this just shows you the third leaf. You can see on the upper left is, would be the one to sample if you want to quantify how many trips are on a, on a plant, if you were that way inclined. OK. Um, Here's just some other data which shows how the uh, damage symptoms on a plant will increase over about a two-month period. And you can see the colored lines represent the numbers of thrips on terminals, buds, and flowers. So you can see that reliably you get more thrips on the foliar terminals than you will in the flowers or the buds. And so that's the place to look for them. I just want to say, spend a few minutes talking about cultural controls. Um, in in terms of uh, ways to manage chili thrips. Um, so one thing we've discovered is that different roses have different tolerances or susceptibilities. Um, I did a, a, a little bit of work on this. Um, and basically, what we found is when we used the knockout rose, the knockout shrub rose, which is the most widely produced as a standard, um, Mrs. B.R. Kent, now this is an um, old-fashioned tea rose, 
this one seems to stand up relatively well. It's a, it's a pretty rose, and it, it seems to be less tolerant to chili trips damage. Um, some work from Sydney Park Brown in Florida as well. One of her students uh, also found similar results when this plant was grown in a in a, uh, a low input landscape situation. It typically suffered less trips damage. Here's another one that performed quite well. This is a, a miniature climber. This is Red Cascade. Again, reliably uh, less issues with chili thrips in a in a replicated block trial. Um, a third one, just one more I want to show you. This is a chestnut rose. This is a rose species, um, and this also uh, typically received a lot less problems with chili thrips. And this this is a, a prolific bloomer. It's a nice rose, very small leaved. It kind of has like hairs and little spines on there, so might not be popular amongst all, all people. But um, And there is a paper in Hort Technology you can look up which quantifies some of these varieties. This is uh, Mangandi et al. in 2013. So I'll, I'll move on. Um, another thing we can often do to reduce insect pressure is to reduce fertilization. This is something that might be of interest to growers. This is just a slide that was shared to me by mm -hmm. Yan Chen mm -hmm. LSU. She was trying to identify if you can reduce fertilizer rates to um, benefit, mm -hmm. to, to reduce issues with chili thrips. And I think her data, she basically showed that the, the five grams of nitrogen per plant, which is about the upper end of the label rate, seemed to get the best plant quality. And the increased damage from chili thrips was only marginal. So she, based on that data, there wasn't much evidence that producers should restrict fertilizer programs to benefit um, to reduce the thrips reproductive potential. Uh, I, probably too much information on this slide, but this was some work that quantified whether you can prune the plants to prune out the chili thrips damage. And we did a number of trials with this. You know, you, because they're on the foliar terminals, if you prune plants and destroy those bag and remove those plants, you're removing the source infest, you're re removing the pests. But typically as soon as you have an established infestation, you're always going to get reinfestation, often from the soil or perhaps from nearby plants. And so pruning by itself is not an effective strategy to eliminate chili thrips unless you just do it rigorously um, for a period of months. Okay, natural enemies. So chili thrips have a number of natural enemies, and they do have, they are important. We, we know that, especially in a landscape situation where you're not constantly using insecticides. We know that the, the balance of pests are often dictated by what's feeding on them. Um, so these are things that attack chili thrips that we know about. We've got the pirate bugs, or the aureus. These are probably the single most important natural enemy that, that, that we know impacts flower thrips, and we also know they feed on chili thrips. Um, predatory mites. There's a number of predatory mites that feed on chili thrips. So I'll, I'll come back to that in the next slide. We also know that lace wings, predatory thrips, some lady lady birds or ladybugs um, are also generalist predators are also important. And there's a number of diseases as well that thrips can get, typically fungal diseases. And um, I don't know how common they are naturally, but some pesticides are formulated with the fungal diseases, and they can be used to to, uh, to target thrips as well. Um, now, one of the things that I've found in the past is that if you don't spray plants, sometimes in a landscape situation, sometimes the, the damage tolerances will be acceptable based on natural control. Um, but with the case of, of roses, or at least the case of knockout roses, that's not the case. We found typically um, unsprayed knockout roses, and this one trial had typically one to two thrips per sample. I believe a sample was a, was a foliar terminal, or it may have been a couple of foliar terminals. Um, compared to less than one thrips per sample in two other common plants, Indian hawthorn and uh, plumbago, at least in this trial. Um, and so we don't think that natural enemies by themselves are really going to control chili thrips, which kind of leaves us with cultural controls and biological or chemical controls. So that's what we're facing. Um, one of the things I was interested in is whether we can release natural enemies because there's obviously an industry now that sells many of these things for thrips. Um, now on roses, I, I have not found this approach successful. Um, this was a trial done with, uh, I believe, the Swirsky mite and the Cucumorous mite. We would release them on the roses, but they would not persist and they would not uh, uh, prevent thrip damage, unfortunately. 
Now, I have found an endemic species of spider mite called Galandromus hel hel helviolus, which does seem to have a lot more promise, but currently no one's rearing that. And so one of the things that would be fun to do would be to try to see if we could get them mass released, mass reared, um, and then test them. And I believe that that might be a, a strategy to, that would work. Okay, insecticides. So currently most um, growers that grow knockout roses are, are on a relatively heavy insecticide program for, uh, for thrips and for aphids and other things. Um, this is a list of materials that are currently registered for thrips control on ornamental plants in Texas, at least. Um, so we've got some older materials like methiocarb, um, a number of the, the neonicotinoids, which of course you, you hear so much about these days, that are registered for thrips control and will give some, do give some control um, in some tests, but they're not always effective. A lot depends on how quickly the plant's growing and, um, and also perhaps how well established the thrips infestation is. Spinosad, uh, I've always found that works very well. That's always been a reliable um, a reliable method. It doesn't have a long residual, but it always seems to work quite well and is relatively benign to most natural enemies. Um, Abamectin also is registered, um, but this is a bit harsher on, on beneficials, so uh, and it's always not, not clear to me that it always works well for chili thrips. You've got some newer materials such as um, Aria and Pylon, which uh, are now registered, and, and they definitely work relatively well. Um, although Pylon is only as a greenhouse label. Um, there's also some biologicals. So we have the Bovaria uh, bassiana fungus, which is under various trade names. And that can work quite well um, under certain situations where the environmental conditions are well are, are, are suitable. Um, probably better in a greenhouse situation than in a landscape situation. Um, as a direction as well, an overture is, is, is another one that's, re that's registered. Um, and one material I found that works very well is Expire. Um, that works very, very well for chili trips on roses, but currently um, the registration has been pulled. Um, it, it got tied up with the um, EPA legislation with the neonicotinoids. And although, although technically it's not a neonicotinoid, um, it nevertheless has had its registration status suspended. So I believe it might come back, but, but this and uh, it might get a residential label. I don't know, but, but it, it, it it's probably the, the best insecticide I've seen for, for chili thrips currently. Um, okay, so one thing to bear in mind for any kind of thrips management program is that there's going to you can have a different approach depending on whether you're a producer or whether you're just dealing with this pest um, in a landscape situation. Um, and so some of the growers that I've worked with or that my colleagues have worked with. Um, many of them are really on a, at least through a large part of the season, uh, in Florida at least, they're on a weekly um, program for spraying. And, and that's because in their case, they think that that reflects the risk of, of, of damage. Um, now in many cases, you know, they may not be scouting and there may not be a need to treat, but that's typically what's, what's being done in, in, in many cases. Um, now. Landscapers really need to adopt different aesthetic thresholds. The, the, these chili thrips has got so many um, alternate host plants. I didn't really talk too much mm -hmm. about that, but we know that it's um, it's going to be on um, other flowering plants in the landscape. It's probably going to be on some of the asters. We know it can develop on um, a lot of different things, and so you're not going to eliminate it once it's become established. Um, for example, in the Houston area. You know, even though it's being treated quite, it, it's it's been coming back every year. Um, it's really impossible to eliminate it, and so there, I think there's a question that that um, people need to understand a bit. What is their what are their thresholds and tolerances, and how can they they, they best manage uh, chili thrips? And I, I don't have all the answers, obviously, but um, um, it's just something I wanted to to, to mention. Um, Okay, well, I've gone through that relatively quickly, uh, which is good, so I don't take up your whole lunch time. Uh, this is a picture here of a, of a producer in Florida um, that's one of the larger producers of knockout roses. Um, they provided 
plants to me in the past, and I, I always felt really bad about taking their plants, but they, they pointed out that through much of the year, they'll, they'll ship out over 30,000 plants a week. So, you know, the few hundred that I had were, were, no, were no big deal for them. But, um, so, yeah, it is a, it, chili trips is a big problem. Um, there are some great resources out there. I, I mentioned Gay Hammond earlier. She's a wonderful source of information. Um, and I hope she doesn't mind me sharing her email. Um, she, she certainly knows a lot about the seasonality of chili thrips. Um, from what I can understand, I've been looking for it around here. I haven't found it yet. I, I believe it starts to show up in sort of March, um, often on Indian Hawthorne, and then it will be common and throughout the end, of, throughout the fall, um, it seems to be a common. And then we don't really know too much about what it does in, in the winter. Um, it probably doesn't reproduce, but it certainly doesn't go away. Um, in terms of how far north it will go in the state, that's not clear to me. The furthest north we've had it intercepted is uh, Fort Worth, but I don't know whether it would be established there. Um, so that's something to, to, to look at. So I hope that some of this information is, is helpful. Oh, I should also point out um, uh, Irfan. Um, the IPM program specialist up, up in Overton, I believe he has a sample submission form. If you have a sample, he would be one person to send them to, and I've included his email there. He's very knowledgeable on thrips and uh, ornamental plants and uh, can certainly give some advice on, on that. And then in terms of the, the DNA biotyping work uh, that I mentioned earlier, um, the, the, the guy in Florida, Vivek Kumar, is, is, is doing a lot of that, coordinating that work. So I included his email as well. So um, and I'm very happy to answer any questions you all may have. I, I uh, may have rushed over some areas, but um, I appreciate everyone's attention. And, and uh, you know, I don't think we're going to see the last of this pest for a while. So hopefully we can get, get a better handle on how, how to manage it in the future. OK. All right, yeah. Um, uh, well, thank you so much for the uh, for the uh, presentation. Thank